Hi, my name is Victoria and I'm a thyroid cancer survivor. We are at the 22nd International Thyroid Cancer Survivors Association Conference in Denver, Colorado. I'm here with Dr. Maria Albuja Cruz. Dr. Albuja Cruz, thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. So we're going to be talking about hypoparathyroidism after surgery. But before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm an endocrine surgery surgeon at the University of Colorado. I specialize in the treatment of thyroid cancer, parathyroid diseases, and adrenal cancer. Uh, I was born in Ecuador, and I did my surgery training at the University of Colorado and did an endocrine surgery fellowship at Miami and was recruited back to my institution to do endocrine surgery. Sounds great. Thank you so much, and thanks again for joining us. So can you tell us a little bit about hypoparathyroidism? What is hypoparathyroidism, and why does it sometimes happen after surgery? So hyperparathyroidism is a disease in which there is low production of parathyroid hormone. Um, and parathyroid hormone has a very close relationship with your calcium metabolism. So our body wants to be, have a very tight calcium metabolism. Uh, and how we achieve that is by these parathyroid hormones. And it's a very straightforward feedback mechanism. So when your calcium uh, level in the blood is low, it uh, gets signals to your parathyroids to produce more parathyroid hormone and vice versa. So the parathyroids are organs that are located just behind the thyroid and sometimes very confusing their name because para next to the thyroid. Mm -hmm. But they have a very defined capsule and a structure that's completely separate from the thyroid. So doing thyroid surgery, as you can imagine because of their close relationship, they can be injured during the operation, and sometimes these parathyroids can be inside the thyroid because of the embryological descent with the thyroid. And sometimes maybe if the thyroid are left in place, they can be stunned. And sometimes the perfusion to, to it, because both of them, the, all four of them are irrigated by the inferior thyroid artery, that can be compromised during the thyroid surgery. And that's why patients after surgery can, can have problems with calcium. Fortunately, the majority of the time is just temporary, but sometimes, unfortunately, it can be permanent. So how often does this happen? Is it rare or is it fairly common? It will all depend. Okay. Uh, in the hands of an expert um, endocrine surgeon is a rare event. Uh, the risk of that happening is about 3% permanently and 15% uh, temporarily. Um, the precautions that ones have to have, if for whatever reason they are dissected with the thyroid and you can see them, is just reimplant them back in your neck. Oh, okay. So then if I'm a patient who is about to undergo surgery, you mentioned having an experienced surgeon is important. Is there anything else that I should do or know um, to try to reduce my risk of having hypoparathyroidism after surgery? So, there is nothing you can do. There are some studies that have suggested that low vitamin D deficiency put patients at risk of uh, temporary hypocalcemia after surgery, but there is equally amount of studies that prove that's the case versus having no relationship. But the most important thing on those outcomes are gonna be the experience of the surgeons, ones that does a very find dissection or then know how to identify them and reimplant them in the neck. So this is something that we hear often is the importance of finding the right surgeon or the most experienced surgeon. So are there questions that thyroid cancer um, patients should ask the surgeon before the surgery? Yeah, I think the main question they should ask and all of us want to be asked is how many of these operations we do a year. Okay. Uh, surgeons should know their outcomes. Uh, we should be able to tell how often uh, these complications happen to us, how um, percentage is temporary versus permanent. And the same thing with other complications of thyroidectomy, like nerve injury. Okay. So definitely the question I will recommend to us, how many of these cases do you do a year and the complexity of them? Okay, and is there a ballpark number that we should be looking for? Or what's a good number, baseline? So for, um, 
Very basic cases. Um, the literature suggests 50, 50. Uh, per year, okay. which is very small amount. Yeah. So in the ballpark of more than 100, 150 should be good. Okay, sounds great. That's really useful information. Um, is there, okay, so let's say I just had surgery. Um, what are some of the signs of hypoparathyroidism? And as a patient, I had my surgery, they send me home. Is there anything that I should be looking for or aware of? So the symptoms of hypoparathyroidism are numbness or tingling in your fingertips or around your mouth. People can have uh, muscle uh, contractions. Uh, they can have um, spasms that's very severe. Um, so basically are those the symptoms that a patient could have. Something to know is any electrolyte abnormality can cause the same symptoms. So sometimes magnesium deficiency can cause the same symptoms. But in the setting of hypocalcemia, the first culprit is going to be the calcium. Um, at the university, we follow a protocol. So depending on what stratification for risk of hypocalcemia that you have, we may prophylactically give you or not calcium supplementation plus or not a specific form of vitamin D to try to prevent the symptoms. Um, and is that before the surgery or after the surgery? After the surgery. After the surgery, mm -hmm. okay, okay. So will you know, like as a patient, you've just had surgery, will you know before you go home if you have hypoparathyroidism or does it sometimes show up after you've gone home? That's a great question. Um, that's why we, with this protocol, we try to understand which patients are at risk in trying to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. So the calcium uh, drop sometimes it lags a little bit. So m likely in the first day after surgery, you will not feel it, but usually the symptoms start appearing second and third day. Okay. And that's the reason why s some people will argue that everybody should go home on calcium supplementation because truly they don't have much side effects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some people may experience a little bit of constipation, but preventing those symptoms may be important. Um, we kind of trying to do a more targeted approach and giving the medication to the patients that need it rather to standardize it. So from our experience, if you are high risk, um, the risk of coming back to the emergency apartment, if we prophylactic give you the medication is very, very low. Okay. We may have some calls and we may have to back up the medication, increase the dose a little bit. But with the protocol, fortunately, we have decreased significantly amount of the patients that needed IV calcium or to be admitted for infusion of calcium in mm -hmm. worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. And also with the protocol, not increase the visits to the ED or uh, to the office. So the surgeon should have a protocol um, to treat the potential hypocalcemia. And I think the majority just send patients on calcium supplementation. Okay, so let's say, uh, just one more question. If, if, if my doctor sends me home and I start to feel these symptoms, is it dangerous? Should, like, do, should I just ignore them or pay attention? Do I call the doctor? So definitely pay attention. Okay. Uh, what we recommend is to take an extra dose of the calcium that you were given, and if you were not, Tums for the belly for mm -hmm. acid reflux has calcium carbonate. So the recommendation will be to take a thousand milligrams right away, okay. and to give a call to our to your surgeon office. Okay. And uh, usually we will get them back into the clinic and measure the calcium and PTH levels and other electrolytes. Okay. Um, if the calcium is normal, that sometimes happens that you can have symptoms for other reasons, but uh, depending on how low the calcium is, we may prescribe more calcium medication or vitamin D, and in very rare cases needed to be admitted to be given calcium by the vein. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you think thyroid cancer patients should know about hypoparathyroidism after surgery? I think the main important, as you stated, is to find experienced surgeon because that's the way to avoid it. Because temporary, as I said, can, is in the ballpark of 15%, but the one that becomes very problematic is the permanent one. Yeah. And fortunately, the majority of patients that have permanent hypoparathyroidism that's defined by the need of calcium supplementation six months after surgery are not um, the symptoms are not too severe. 
But unfortunately, there is a portion of the population that is so severe that they require IV calcium infusions daily or needed to be on this uh, recombinant parathyroid hormone replacements that are very expensive. And the quality of life is significantly reduced. Okay. So, so again, re-emphasizes the importance of finding a good experienced surgeon mm -hmm. when possible. Yes. Sounds great. Dr. Albu Hakruz, thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you for watching. We hope that you've learned about hypoparathyroidism. Thank you.